Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hi, this is Jim Holly, and welcome to the Motocross Vault. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at one of the most successful 125 racers of the 1970s, Suzuki's RM125 for 1979. Now, today Suzuki is a bit of an afterthought in Supercross and National Motocross Racing. Unfortunately, they've pulled virtually completely out of racing. Um, obviously, though, I think there's economic issues there back in Japan, and the fact that they really haven't kept up with the same level of development some of the other manufacturers. They've almost kind of seat of the market but it's hard to fathom how successful suzuki was in the 1970s when you view them today because in the 70s in spite of not being the largest manufacturer they were by far the most successful they won like i think it was 14 world motocross championships in a row in the 125 class i mean the rms and the ra works bikes were just unbeatable it's incredible in the 500s they had guys like roger de costa in the 250s they had joel robert who unfortunately just passed away just kicking everybody's butt. They were just a just a dominant force in motocross. And it really is incredible how this scrappy little team uh, from Hamamatsu, Japan, really put it to all the big guns of Europe and Japan. And it really is such a bummer for me. I've had many, many Suzukis over the years. Love them. They're great machines in a lot of ways. It's so sad to see. You know, I hope five years from now they even exist as far as motocross goes. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. You know, obviously these things go up and down. KTM had the same issue in the early 90s where they went bankrupt in like 91, 92, and look what them now. So these things can make turnarounds. I mean, the world is very uncertain these days. But that being said, if you look back in the in the time machine here a little bit, Suzuki was kicking butt at the time. They were, from the time the RM125 came out in 75, uh, pretty much until the end of the decade, they were number one or number two every year. Some years the YZ gave them a little bit of a run for their money. Uh, but really, Kawasaki, Honda, they were not much of a, you know, even a, really an afterthought. After the after the RM and the YZ came out, the Elsinore kind of tapered off a little bit, and uh, Suzuki just kicked butt. So bikes like this 79, they really were the machine to have. If you looked at the starting lines in the 70s, you know, they were a, a sea of yellow. You know, uh, the RMs were just great bikes. And the 79, although it has some really weird styling, this is the year they went with the strange little duckbill uh, fender front and back. It was just bizarre not a fan of that look uh but the machine's performance was excellent so this is going to be a quick look back at uh, that 79 machine and just what it was like at the time now if you like this sort of thing make sure you check out some of the other videos i've done i've done several other motocross retrospectives on different machines from enduro to off-road to atv to motocross i cover everything on this channel so if you're into some kind of off-road stuff i'm very agnostic about that you just check out some of the other videos i've done now, if you'd like to support what I do here, I have Motocross Vault merch available. I just came out with an all-new design based on uh, the 1990 KDX 200. I'm a huge fan of KDXs. I've had a couple of them over the years. Super fun little bikes. And I just did a version of it with the shirt on here. I'm also going to do a version with it in the back of a truck. I'm thinking maybe like a 1990 or 91 uh, Chevrolet K1500 maybe. Uh, something to that effect. So I also just did a version with a uh, 1996 KX500 somebody asked me to do. So always got a few of these designs in the works. I've got tons of other ones available on my Teespring store. Uh, so if you check that out, the link will be in the description below, and I'll put a little card here in the video. Uh, and if you'd like to share, subscribe, uh, tell your friends on social media as well, I'd really appreciate helping uh, helping me get the word out on the channel and uh, letting everybody know about it. And I do appreciate all the support we get here. So here, without further ado, is the story of the 1979 Suzuki RM125. The 1970s were a great era for Suzuki's motocross program. At the pro level, they dominated winning countless national and Grand Prix motocross titles during that decade. At the local level, they were just as successful, with an excellent line of RM motocross machines. The RMs were light, fast, well-suspended, and ultra-competitive. During the 70s, the 125 class had risen from a bit of an afterthought to one of the most hotly contested divisions in motocross. The arrival of the Honda CR125M Elsinore in 1974 ignited America's desire for light, fun, and affordable racers. The Elsinore was ready to go right off the showroom floor, and overnight, the country's tracks were awash with silver and green bullets. The Honda's lead was short-lived, however. Both Yamaha's YZ125 and Suzuki's RM125 quickly eclipsed the Elsinore's performance and set up a power struggle for 125 dominance that would play out through the remainder of the decade. 
Both Honda and Kawasaki continued to produce 125 racers, but most years they were little more than also rans. All that changed in 1979 with the introduction of the most competitive lineup of 125 machines ever to grace America's motocross tracks. After several years of mildly refreshed retreads, Honda was back with an all-new machine that featured work styling, ultra-long travel suspension, and a bucket of bright red paint. Kawasaki was likewise back with an all-new works replica of their own, the KX125A5. The racy new A5 promised pro-ready performance and limited edition exclusivity to the few souls lucky enough to acquire one of the rare machines. With Yamaha providing Suzuki's greatest challenge in 1978, the YZ was back with a less radical list of changes. A beefed up frame for 79 improved handling, and new suspension front and rear increased travel slightly. The motor also received new porting specs that looked to take the 78 YZ's high RPM power band and bring it down a bit to better compete with the class leading RM. On the Suzuki side of the equation, the men from Hamamatsu were not content to sit on their laurels for 1979. With so much new competition in the class, the engineers knew they would need to pull out all the stops to keep the RM at the front in 1979. With that in mind, they scrapped 90% of their shootout winning 78 machine and dialed up an all new yellow buzz bomb for 79. Everything was revamped, relocated, and reimagined on the new machine. All new plastic gave the bike a fresh, if somewhat controversial look, and an all new suspension boosted travel front and rear. The motor was massaged for more power, and the frame was tweaked to increase strength and improve handling. Aside from the grips and levers, everything was all new on the 79RM. On the chassis side, Suzuki had to make several changes to accommodate the longer travel they added for 1979. The new chromoly steel frame featured beefed up tubing and a redesigned engine cradle. The foot peg mounts were stronger for 79 and paired with new pegs that improved control. Rake remained unchanged, but the new frame offered 7mm more trail than 1978. An all-new extruded alloy swing arm was bolted on that looked trick and promised reduced flex under heavy loads. Both wheels were new, with a full-width front hub replacing the conical design of 78. For 1979, all the plastic was new, with a slightly larger 1.7-gallon tank replacing the 1.6-gallon unit of the year before, and new FIM-mandated side plates that moved the number plates rearward slightly for easier viewing and better scoring. There were new fenders both front and rear that offered improved coverage and very unique styling. These new heavily valence fenders were easily the most controversial part about the RM's new look, and riders tended to love them or hate them with a passion. Early release models featured this design both front and rear, with machines made later in the year adopting a more traditional look for the front fender. The saddle was also new with a revised shape and a slick new RM125 logo silk screened onto the sides. On the motor front, Suzuki once again started from scratch in 1979. The redesigned motor maintained the 123 cc of displacement and 54 by 54 millimeter bore and stroke it had employed in 1978, but added all new porting to boost mid-range power. The new cylinder featured larger fins for increased cooling and a steel liner that allowed overboring in the case of a seizure. This was a nice feature that both the Honda, which used a chrome bore, and the Kawasaki, which used a version of an electrofusion coating, liners did not allow. For 1979, Suzuki did make the steel liner slightly thinner for improved heat dispensation, however. The new motor continued to employ the semi-case reed power reed design Suzuki had been using since 1976. This design was said to offer both the improved low and response of a reed valve unit and the high RPM power of a traditional piston port arrangement. For 1979, the reed cage was slightly smaller and featured two large reed pedals instead of multiple smaller ones like it had the year before. Feeding fuel and air to the motor was a new 32mm McCuny carburetor and a redesigned airbox that offered improved sealing and easier access. As in 1978, ignition duties were handled by Suzuki's Pointless Electronic Ignition, or PEI, with a single spark plug centrally located in the head. For 1979, the head gasket thickness was increased 1mm and a new squish band was employed to improve combustion. Moving all of those spent gases out of the motor was a redesigned exhaust and silencer combination that was tuned to work with the new power profile. As was common for the era, the RM silencer was steel and non-rebuildable. Finishing off the motor package was a new clutch and a revised six-speed transmission that raised gearing slightly across the board. On the track, the new motor package proved to be one of the most effective available in 1979. At peak, it posted a whopping 2 horsepower gain over 78 and offered an excellent mid-range focused power band that blasted the RM out of turns and to the front. Unlike 78, there was not a lot of top-end power available, but it was brutally effective if ridden correctly. 
As was typical of 125s of the pre-Power Valve era, there was not a lot of grunt available below the mid-range, but the RM offered enough pull to get you from the truck to the starting line, which was all most serious 125 pilots were looking for at the time. For riders accustomed to the high RPM antics of the previous RM125, the new mid-range power band took a little getting used to, but once you learned to shift it a little bit earlier, it was easily one of the best power packages available in 1979. As successful as the motor changes for 79 turned out to be, they paled in comparison to the utter domination Suzuki showed on the suspension front. Up front, Suzuki pulled out the big guns by bolting on a set of massive for the time 38mm Kiaba forks. These forks were 2mm larger in diameter than 78, and by far the largest diameter units found in the 125 class. In 1979, even some 250s did not come with 38mm front forks. In addition to being stronger, the new forks offered over 2 inches more travel than 78. This gave the arm the most travel in the class at a full 11.2 inches. While there was no external adjustments available for damping, they did offer air caps at the top of each fork to allow air pressure to be adjusted to fine tune the ride. Out back, the new arm used a set of laid down Kiaba shocks to deliver a class leading 11 inches of travel. This was a full 2.2 inches more than 1978. The new shocks incorporate remote reservoirs to help reduce fading and offer two adjustable settings for damping performance. To change the settings, the shock had to be removed and partially disassembled, but at least there was some level of adjustment offered. One other nice feature added to the arms Kiaba dampers for 79 was a set of rubber bumpers at the base of each shock shaft. This was done to both protect the shock bodies and lessen the metal to metal clank felt when the shocks bottomed out. Out in the rear world of jumps, whoops, and ruts, the arm delivered by far the best ride in the class. The RM's long travel forks provided a plush ride that none of its competition could match. The beefy 38mm sliders gave the front end a more precise feel in the rough and kept flex to a minimum on hard hits. Only the RM was capable of handling big hits and small chop with equal ease. Really fast guys might have wanted stiffer springs, but for most riders, a tweak in the oil and air pressure was all that was needed to dial in the forks. In the rear, the RM's KYB shocks were once again the king of the class. They offered an ultra-plush ride on small hits and a sufficient level of comfort over large G-outs. Although there were two damping settings available, there did not seem to be much perceptible difference between the two on the track. With either setting engaged, the arms dampers gobbled up bumps and sharp hits far better than any other machines in the class. With its remote reservoirs, there was also far less of the fade seen on the Honda and Yamaha rear ends. About the only real complaint riders had with the rear end's performance was the fact that the shocks could not be rebuilt and had to be replaced once they started to wear out. On the handling front, the 1979 RM125 was not the shredder we have come to associate with Suzuki machines in the modern era. Steering precision was decent, but some riders complained about the tall stance hindering the steering feel. Shorter bikes like the YZ offered a more hunkered down feel in the turns that riders of the time had become more accustomed to. Of course, all of these bikes would feel small today, but riders in 1979 were not used to machines with skyscraper seat heights and ultra long travel suspension. Compared to the competition, the RM offered only mediocre turning, but it did feature rock-solid stability. Its supple suspension made the bike far less of a handful in the rough, and that advantage only amplified as the speeds increased. If you were planning on pinning it through the Southwick sand, then the RM was your machine. On the detailing front, the new RM was mostly well-regarded for its time. Nearly everyone loved the new shape of the seat, but most riders were not a big fan of the oddball rear fender. The new FIM side plates looked sano, but refused to stay on for any length of time. For some reason, the bolts holding them on absolutely refused to stay tight, and pretty much every magazine test mentioned having to rig up some manner to keep them from falling off mid-moto. The stock bars were butter soft, which was pretty par for the course of the time, but also prone to whacking the knees of taller riders in the turns, which nobody much cared for. The stock decals were even less durable than the wet noodle bars, and most only lasted an afternoon before they were ejected. To reduce the drag on the motor, Suzuki engineers had saw fit to mount a flimsy 428 chain on the RM. This chain was unfortunately barely suitable for a Mini. It stretched, broke, and ejected circlips at an alarming rate. Most savvy racers upgraded to a 520 chain in short order. Last of the major gripes was the RM stock throttle, which featured a grip so short that many riders' hands actually hung over the end of it. The cable was also garbage and flexed heavily when the throttle was applied quickly. Once again, most smart riders quickly ash canned this unit for an aftermarket alternative. On the plus side for 1979 were the RM's powerful motor, supple suspension, excellent stability, and proven track record of winning. It was not a perfect 125 racer, but in 1979, it was as close as you were going to get to the ultimate Tiddler class weapon. In 125 Pro Racing at the time, there was a reason most every privateer rode a Suzuki, 
For nearly a decade, the RM was the dominant machine in 125 racing. And in 1979, Suzuki upheld that tradition by delivering a knockout punch to the most competitive field of 125 racers the sport had ever seen. So there you have it. There's a look back at the 1979 RM125, a machine with some very unique styling, but some great performance on the track. Uh, Suzuki, again, in this era was just awesome. They were kicking butt. Uh, they were a year or two away from the full floater at this point, and then once the full floater came out there, they just kept on rolling. You know, had guys like Mark Barnett on the track doing really well in the early 80s. You had guys like Akira Watanabe, uh, Gaston Rayer winning on the, on the world stage. Just a phenomenal era to be riding uh, Suzuki's. And um, you know, again, such a bummer to see how they're basically just said, screw it, we're not going to deal with motocross these days. It's it's really sad to see. Hopefully someone in Japan will, uh, you know, decide they want to recommit to, to motocross in the future and Suzuki will still be around, you know, five, ten years from now. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, I know bikes like this certainly have a solid following, you know, in the vintage community. People love these old RMs. Um, they're good little bikes and fun machines to restore and what have you. So, uh, again, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. If you could like, subscribe, share on social media, I would very much appreciate it. I, I read all the comments. I love all the interaction we get here on the channel. And I definitely read them, and I appreciate all the support you guys give me out there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I definitely appreciate it. So, until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from Motocross Fault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.